Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about my top 12 running back rankings for the 2022 fantasy football season. Now, on today's episode, of course, we are talking about blue chip running backs, RB1s, guys that should be selected within the first three rounds of your respective draft, regardless of scoring format, because of what they produce on a weekly basis. Now, the reason why I wanted to go ahead and talk about top tier players and specifically kind of highlight them is because it's important to define what these players present on a weekly basis and what they offer and the reason why we want to potentially draft them in 2022 while also separating them from one another. Again, there's a difference between Jonathan Taylor and Christian McCaffrey and defining that exact reason kind of gives us more insight as to how we can navigate our early round selections and how we can set ourselves up for success in 2022. And that's what we're basically going to cover on today's episode as I'll go ahead and give you guys my opinions and statistics that justify my rankings and of course give you guys more context as to why I trust these respective running backs going into the 2022 fantasy football season. Now I did bring up the concept a little bit earlier of navigating your respective draft and finding more success in doing so. And the question I've heard all off season is, Andrew, how do I get better at drafting? How do I build rosters that I'm comfortable with? How do I get the most possible advantage I can out of a draft? And my number one suggestion almost every single time is just to draft more. The more you find yourself drafting, the more teams you put together, the more comfortable you will be in the difficult decision-making processes that a draft presents every single time. So the more practice you get, the better you will be. And the number one way I suggest that is, of course, via underdog fantasy. I don't want you guys drafting against bots. I don't want you drafting against inexperienced players on like Yahoo formats that guys are taking quarterbacks number one overall. Those experiences aren't going to set you up for success, but rather signing up today via Underdog Fantasy and participating in their best ball drafts, whether it's Best Ball Mania 3 that has, you know, a giant prize pool or the Palmeridian draft, the puppy draft, getting yourself more experience there against the actual live ADPs that a lot of people are participating in and most likely your home leagues will kind of be participating in is only going to help gain you experience and get yourself in an extremely advantageous position when we get to our 2022 fantasy football drafts for your respective home leagues as the weeks progress, you know, getting closer to the season. Again, we're just five weeks away from the start of the 2022 NFL season, so be sure to take advantage of Underdog Fantasy today. Again, if you go ahead and click the link down in the description or use promo code Andrew today, Underdog Fantasy is willing to match up to $100 of your first deposit. Again, you deposit $100, they'll match $100, get you ready for the 2022 season by drafting all August, getting yourself as much experience via Best Ball Mania, and building as many you know overall rosters as you possibly can from various different pick positions. It'll gain you experience and get yourself in a position that maybe you end up winning some cash. You never know. You end up you know winning the milli and walking off into the sunset as an absolute legend. Check that out today. Use promo code Andrew via Underdog Fantasy. Thank you very much. All right. So let's talk about the subject for today's video, our top 12 running back rankings for the 2022 fantasy football season. Like I always mention via my videos, I want to go ahead and rank via half PPR, meeting everyone in the middle, whether you play full PPR or standard. So again, beginning with our number one, the player that sits behind me, the former 2021 number one overall running back, Jonathan Taylor. And it fits suit that he's going to be my number one overall running back ranked for 2022 as he had a dominant season last year. But really, Jonathan Taylor has been this player since week 13 of the 2020 season. You go back to 2020 and you look at these game logs and the amount of production and opportunity specifically that he was given since week 13 of 2020. There's a reason why I wanted to put that stat up on screen. Since week 13, he's averaged 21.75 fantasy points per game in those last 22 contests. That level of productivity is unmatched. There's a reason why many of us ended up winning fantasy championships due to the efforts of one Jonathan Taylor. And the opportunity that he was given throughout that last 22 game span, I mean, it's, it's elite. 19 and a half attempts per game, 2.86 targets per game. Obviously, this is not a guy that is going to get himself seven receptions a contest but you know he it's not out of the realm of possibility he's just primarily a guy behind this offensive line in this scheme for the indianapolis colts that is going to run the ball and he's going to find a lot of success down in the red zone i mean in the last 22 games he has scored 28 total touchdowns that kind of level of productivity it's just a guarantee that he is going to end up scoring for you and not only that like i mentioned on the ground in 12 of the last 22 games, he has surpassed over 100 rushing yards. That's 54% of the time. And in 16 of the last 22 games, which is 73% of the time, he has totaled 100 yards, whether that's rushing and or receiving. So again, this amount of productivity that he has henceforth put out there leads me to believe he is absolutely going to be the number one running back in fantasy. But 
That's not where I leave it. I've got a lot more stats. Let's talk about the division he plays within. Let's talk about the AFC South. When you get to play against the Houston Texans and the Jacksonville Jaguars twice a season, and sometimes the Tennessee Titans are caught lacking, that is one of the easiest divisions to play in. I mean, again, in the last 22 games, in the nine contests that he has played against his own respective division, he has averaged 21.00 fantasy points per game in a half PPR scoring format. That level of productivity, I mean, the fact that you can guarantee that six games out of the year, six games out of the 16 that we are participating in in order to earn a fantasy football championship is going to be rel relatively easy for a guy like Jonathan Taylor. You know, it only gets better for his overall case. And I talk about the productivity that he has shown in his first two years. And when we talk about this level, we have to compare him to running backs at a very high standard. I mean, Eric Dickerson, Edron James, Clinton Portis, Adrian Peterson, Earl Campbell, Chris Johnson, CJ 2K. These are guys that Jonathan Taylor has very much so kind of compared himself to based on his overall statistics. I mean, when I look at what he's done in his first two years, he's the number seven overall running back in terms of total rushing yards in his first two years. And he's the number four overall running back in rushing touchdowns in his first two years. When you're mentioned in, in, in just a sentence with those other running backs, Hall of Famers, it kind of gives you a little bit of context as to how great Jonathan Taylor is going to continue to be. I mean, in the last five seasons, he's the only running back in fantasy football that has totaled over 2,000 total yards in a season and total of 20 plus touchdowns in that given year. The only running back in that singular category. So obviously we're talking about a special running back. And when we're on the topic of comparing him to other running backs, I wanted to go ahead and share a specific stat that really kind of blew my mind this offseason. In 2021, Jonathan Taylor had 1,272 yards after contact. That in itself, just to put it in perspective, is more than any other running back had total yards after Jonathan Taylor. So for perspective reasons, Nick Chubb, the second highest rushing leader in the National Football League last year, had 1,258. Again, like I mentioned, Jonathan Taylor had more yards after contact than Nick Chubb had total rushing yards. I mean, the, the amount of production this young man put forth only continues to build. And it's because of the offense that he's within. When we talk about what Frank Wright, the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts has built there, the offensive line elite, and the amount of opportunity he has given to his respective running backs is bar, bar none the best in the league. In fact, since Frank Wright took over the Indianapolis Colts in 2018, the Indianapolis Colts have been the number one overall team in terms of giving their running backs opportunities. Opportunities meaning rushing attempts or targets. I mean, if you're number one at that position, of course, your leading running back should be in a great position. Now, when we're talking about rushing attempts alone and not counting targets, they're the number two ranked team since 2018, only behind, of course, the Tennessee Titans. Of course, Derrick Henry getting himself a lot of touches within that respective offense. But there's a lot of opportunities to go around in this offense. A lot of people may look at it, Naeem Hines and, and kind of get a little bit worried. Hey, maybe Naeem Hines is going to get carved out a bigger opportunity here. Maybe they want to use uh, Jonathan Taylor less in order to conserve him. That's not going to be the case. There are so many opportunities to grow around in this offense that Naeem Hines will get his. But unfortunately, we've gotten to a point where Naeem Hines no longer has flex value. He has been relegated to a position of being just a handcuff. And that's fine for by me. I mean, I don't mind drafting him as a handcuff because that way, at least I can guarantee to get him in a later round instead of somebody contesting that selection because he does have flex value. Specifically, the reason why I wanted to mention this is because when you go back to 2020, Naeem Hines was averaging 10.3 opportunities per game, nine and a half touches per game. In 2021, that number dipped four in each category, four less opportunities and four less touches per game. Obviously, those have been filtered in the direction of Jonathan Taylor as they believe he is the workhorse back. And on many occasions, we have heard Frank Wright say outright, this is a one back offense and that's how we're going to commit to it by giving Jonathan Taylor the ball. I mean, he's been quoted to say that in a plethora of interviews that I've seen this offseason. And when I go and I look at their personnel, I mean, only 7% of the time last year did they ever use two running backs in a singular formation. So you're never going to see Naeem Hines very often on the field. And if he ever comes in, you might see him steal some value, but it's nothing that's going to get me afraid of drafting Jonathan Taylor. And the final thing I wanted to mention in regards to Jonathan Taylor is, of course, his offensive line. I talked about it earlier. They're elite. That is a fact. But last season, they dealt with a plethora of injuries. They had nine different combinations of starting offensive linemen last season due to said injuries. I mean, we're talking about Quentin Nelson. He missed a lot of time last year. We're talking about their right tackle, Braden Smith, who also dealt with a lot of injuries last season, but he 
is a former top five run blocking uh, offensive tackle in the National Football League. Of course, you're going to go ahead and remove Eric Fisher from the left tackle position. They have Matt Pryor, who they're very confident in. When you go ahead and bring in pieces that are only going to help and you find yourself healthy with this offensive line, they are a dominant force. You also have Mo Ali Cox, the tight end for this team, who is the 13th best run blocking tight end according to Pro Football Focus last season. That just continues to build for this team. So what's the last thing we need to talk about regarding Jonathan Taylor? Probably the quarterback position, right? Because that's the biggest change to this offense. The difference between Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan. Carson Wentz was not a bad quarterback last year. In terms of stats alone, he was great. But in terms of efficiency, the amount of turnover-worthy plays that he had that he wasn't punished for certainly does make a big difference. But the reason why I wanted to mention Matt Ryan is because we always need to keep an eye on, all right, if we're going to get a change at the quarterback position, is that going to affect the potential targets or potential rushing attempts for that running back. Like I've talked about, Frank Wright's offense, regardless of whether it's Carson Wentz, Phillip Rivers, Jacoby Brissett, or Andrew Luck, they're always going to be running the ball consistently. So regardless of what Matt Ryan wants to do this year, he's going to have to, of course, hand the ball off to Taylor. Not only that, I went ahead and I looked at the last four seasons of what Matt Ryan has done uh, with the Atlanta Falcons in terms of targeting his respective running backs. Since 2018, he has, on average, targeted running backs on his team 104 times a season, which is a pretty good number considering last year the Indianapolis Colts and Carson Wentz targeted running backs 113 times. Pretty close number. It's not like we have a, qu a quarterback here that is going to completely refuse the idea of checking it down for his respective running backs. Overall, when we're talking about a player like Jonathan Taylor coming off the number one season, could very easily do it again. I mean, it was just a couple years back we saw Todd Gurley repeat number one overall standings in fantasy football. When you have such a high floor and a high ceiling combo, of course, he should be the first player taken off the board. Let's go ahead and move on to the next running back. My number two for the 2022 season, it is Christian McCaffrey. In my opinion, he is probably the most controversial overall fantasy prospect in 2022 because people don't know what to do with him. But from my perspective, the reason why I have him as my number two is because he's a fantasy legend. What he has accomplished and what he accomplished in 2019 alone makes him one of the best fantasy prospects that's ever existed. I mean, this guy put up a season in which in 2018 specifically, he broke the record for most receptions by a running back in a season. He came back in 2019 and broke his own record with 116 receptions. I mean, in a half PPR, full PPR, those numbers are insane. He's the third ever running back to have a 1,000 rushing and receiving yard season in a single year. And not only that, he's top three in terms of greatest fantasy running back performances of all time. Half PPR put up a 413.2 fantasy point performance in 2019. Those numbers, in my opinion, have kind of lodged him in a position where, yes, I trust Christian McCaffrey blindly. And many of you may be wondering, Andrew, how can you trust him blindly, blindly despite all he has done in the last couple of years in terms of not being on the field? You can't score fantasy points if you are on the IR. Well, I understand that. But I also still want to talk about what he's been able to accomplish even in these last couple of years despite only playing eight full healthy games. Let's talk about it. I mean, ultimately, from 2019 through 2021, in the full healthy games that he participated in, this is a guy in 24 games averaged 24.82 fantasy points per contest. I mean, that level of, level of production is, is second to none, literally. He's better than Jonathan Taylor in that aspect. He's better than guys like uh, Derrick Henry. His ceiling is so damn high because of his receiving potential that he doesn't even need to score touchdowns anymore. Like, just think about this. The averages on screen that you can see from 2019 to 2020 without a single touchdown scored in those games. There were eight contests where he never scored a touchdown and in those games averaged 18.16 fantasy points per game. No other running back can literally do that. No other running back can average that high of a fantasy point total without scoring a touchdown in a given week. Not only that, I mean, we're talking about a running back that ultimately in his career has gotten so much done on the field, they never they, they never have an opportunity to take him off. I mean, overall, he's played 14 of the last 24 games with a 90 plus percent snap share. Uh, you know, 21 of the last 24, 70 plus percent. They can't they can't get him off the field. He is a machine, and Christian McCaffrey has all the trust in the world from me. But despite all these statistics that I can potentially rattle off to you, and I'll, I'll stop from now, there is still the looming question of yes, Andrew. In the last two years, he only played eight full games. Can we really trust this as our number one overall running back? When I look at the fluke injuries that he has obviously sustained, 
And the reason why I say fluke is because he hasn't been injury prone his whole career. 2017 through 2019, never missed a game in the National Football League. In his college career at Stanford, only missed literally one game. Outside of that, the last two years have been pretty hectic for Christian McCaffrey. And they've you know certainly taken its toll on his mental. Because you continue to get healthy, come back, get injured. Get healthy, come back, get injured. And it's tough, but I still really do believe that he is an elite athlete. And the injuries that he sustained, whether it's the AC joint or the hamstring or the ankle sprain, these are things that any running back can sustain. It's the nature of the sport. Everyone's going to get injured. Not a single running back that I'm going to mention today has avoided an injury. Maybe Jonathan Taylor, but that's it. And that's why he's our number one. That's why I have so much confidence in Christian McCaffrey because the stats are there. And regardless of what you think, the opportunity is still going to be there. I know they're going to change offensive coordinators this season to, to Ben McAdoo, but I wanted to talk about the opportunity that they gave and presented running backs last season. Though this team was ranked 29th in terms of total rushing attempts by running backs and 21st in terms of total RB opportunity. I mean, when you compare 2019's overall opportunity to running backs compared to 2021, there's only a 17 opportunity difference. They've been using running backs like Mike Davis in 2020, Chuba Hubbard last year. And regardless of the fact that those running backs aren't Christian McCaffrey, they've committed to continuing to give their respective running backs the ball because that's how this offense functions. And that's how Matt Rule wants to kind of construct this team. And quite frankly, that's how Ben McAdoo wants to construct this team. When we go ahead and we look at what Ben McAdoo did as the head coach of the New York uh, Giants just a couple of years back, 2014 through 2017, the amount of opportunities he gave to his respective running backs was at a really high level. In fact, those running backs averaged 511 opportunities per season. When you're going to get about 390 attempts and 122 targets to your respective running backs a year, a lot of success is potentially going to be found. And unfortunately, Ben McAdoo didn't really have many successful running backs throughout that tenure because you know they didn't have Saquon at that time. But now that he has the potential of a Christian McCaffrey, it's only going to help both of them out. Overall, the last couple of things that I wanted to mention regarding Christian McCaffrey, obviously we have to mention the offensive line for the Panthers. Listen, Christian McCaffrey, regardless of offensive line, regardless of quarterback, has been able to produce in his career. I mean, we talk about the offensive line being some of the worst in the league back in 2019. Now you go ahead and you add the number six overall pick uh, of the 2022 NFL draft as, as the left tackle. You bring in Bradley Bozeman, uh, again, formerly of uh, the Baltimore Ravens, as your center. Austin Corbett, you go ahead and re-sign Taylor Morton. There, there's a lot of potential here for this offensive line to find success. On top of the fact that, of course, Christian McCaffrey is pretty talented he, and he's pretty elusive. So regardless of what the offensive line does up front, he'll be able to find success. The last thing, like I mentioned, regardless of what quarterback they have put with Christian McCaffrey, he has found success. He's played with Cam Newton, Taylor Heineke, Will Greer, Teddy Bridgewater, P.J. Walker, Sam Darnold, Kyle Allen. He has played with seven different quarterbacks in his career as of late. And that in itself leads me to believe that regardless of whether or not it is Baker starting, it doesn't really matter. Baker's going to get in a position where he is conditioned to throw the ball to Christian McCaffrey because he is the offense. I mean, when you go back to the first 30 games that Baker Mayfield played in his career, prior to Kevin Stefanski going to the Cleveland Browns, he was targeting the running back position 7.17 times per game. If you're going to do that with Christian McCaffrey, we're going to be in a good spot. But I think that number is going to even be far more elevated, making McCaffrey's potential that much higher in 2021. Moving on to our number three, we have Derrick Henry. I mean, Derrick Henry, King Henry, last season, prior to his injury, was an unstoppable force. We all know that. But this is something that started pretty much when Ryan Tannehill took over the starting quarterback job for the Tennessee Titans. Going back to... 2019, I think it was week seven. From 2019 through 2020 with Ryan Tannehill under center, Derrick Henry's averaged 21.47 fantasy points per game throughout that 33-game stretch. In fact, throughout that 33-game stretch, he has put up 4,088 rushing yards and 41 touchdowns. I mean, holy moly, has this guy been able to just dominate at all aspects of the game. And even last year, started to get a little bit more receptions. And we'll talk about that in a bit in terms of the opportunity. They continue to accelerate with Derrick Henry at the running back position. But in terms of his productivity, in the last 33 games, 22 games of over 100 total yards, that's 67% of the time, 41 total touchdowns, whether it's rushing, receiving, or even passing touchdowns from Derrick Henry, it's elite. And like I mentioned with Jonathan Taylor, when you play against the division like the AFC South, where you get to play against the Indianapolis Colts, I guess they're, they're a tougher defense, but of course, Derrick Henry finds his success nonetheless. 
when you play against the Houston Texans, Jacksonville Jaguars, four out of the potential 16 games of a fantasy season, no wonder he was averaging 24.65 fantasy points per game against his own division rivals in the last 13 contests that he has participated against them. Of course, this is the running back that was the number two overall guy in 2020, number three overall in 2019. I mean, prior to him leaving with the injury last year of a broken foot, he was the number one running back. And I think we could very easily see him kind of fall back into place. Again, when we're talking about the injury he sustained, it's not like he tore his ACL. He didn't tear his Achilles. We don't need a uh, to worry about you know some soft tissue injury that is going to reoccur. It's a broken foot. It healed. He even played in the playoffs last year, and we saw a lot of productivity out of him, having himself a total of 20 touches. But nonetheless, let's talk about this opportunity that the Tennessee Titans present for him. The Tennessee Titans, since 2019, are the number one overall team in RB rushing attempts and number two overall team in total RB opportunity. When you put that in perspective, obviously Derrick Henry, with the amount of elite talent he has, when you're going to give him the ball 25 times a game, he's going to find success. But let's talk about it. Last season, the offense looked very different. Throughout the first eight games of the 2020 uh, one season, I mean, Derrick Henry was, was the entire offense as a whole. He was averaging 27.4 attempts per game and had himself 2.25 receptions per game. When you're almost averaging 30 touches per game, I mean, the, the pace that he was at, no joke, if he ended up playing the full 17-game season, he would have potentially surpassed 500 total touches in a season, which I don't even think is I've ever seen before. I've never heard of that. That level of productivity is insanity to me. But nonetheless, when you're getting nearly 30 touches a game, of course, you're going to find a lot of fantasy success. And he was purely 40-plus points more than any other running back throughout that time. And Jonathan Taylor was the number two trailing him from very far away. I mean, the, the pace that he was setting is, is insane. And like I mentioned, the offense was different. The targets he was seeing was, was very different. He was on pace to set career highs in all three statistics of targets, receptions, and receiving yards. In fact, if he had ended up playing a full season, he would have had 43 targets, 38 receptions and 327 receiving yards, which by all means, when you add that on top of his level of productivity on the ground, only makes him that much more of a value at his current draft price. When we talk about Derrick Henry, there's always the conversation of what are we going to potentially see in 2022? Is there going to be the potential for more injury risk? Is the offensive line stable enough? You know, are they going to continue to feed him the ball at this level? I mean, when Derrick Henry left last year, when the Tennessee Titans finally found their stride without Derrick Henry in the lineup from weeks 11 through 18, they continued to give the running back the ball. I mean, running backs throughout that time, on average, totaled 21.94 fantasy points per game for the Titans. So that was, you know, the plethora of guys they had. Delonta Foreman, they brought in Adrian Peterson for a little bit of a stint. They had, a you know, a Dontrell Hilliard. All these guys, on average, they totaled 21 plus fantasy points per week, which is pretty much the pace that Derrick Henry was on. And that kind of opportunity is only going to continue in 2022 in my eyes. Now, my biggest concern with Derrick Henry is not injuries. It's in fact the offensive line. They lost two big pieces. They released Roger Saffold, their left guard, who was a top 12 run blocking guard in 2021. And they released David Quisenberry, a top five run blocking right tackle. Both these guys, in fact, went to the Buffalo Bills this offseason. If you lose two of your best offensive linemen in terms of run blocking, that is going to make a huge difference, especially considering we have a running back here who wants to continue to get to 2,000 yards. If you're going to replace him with guys that are just average, below average, it's not going to be pretty. Nonetheless, again, I'm not worried about the injuries. I understand the rule, uh, the quote-unquote law of, a, of 1,500 carries. Uh, there, there's a study out there that... Once a running back gets to 1,500 carries, there is a steep decline. I understand that being the case, but I purely do believe that this may be one of his final hurrah years and that Derrick Henry is just on pace to uh, just, just be a different kind of alien in a sense and kind of maybe just blow past that 1,500 and get to 2,000 and not show signs of slowing down. That is why I have him as my number three. Moving on, we have Austin Eckler of the Los Angeles Chargers. Again, Austin Eckler last year, incredible season. A lot of hype surrounded him during the offseason because Austin Eckler has proven week in and week out of his career that he can be a top five running back. And that's why I have him ranked number four. If you go back to 2019 and you go from 2019 through 2020 without Melvin Gordon in the lineup, he's averaged 18.96 fantasy points per game in 28 total games. That kind of elite production isn't by accident. It's by offensive design, and it's by the skill that Austin Eckler provides. 
whether that's rushing, whether that's receiving, he has been elite. I mean, you go back to 2019, of course, he was the number six overall running back. You go back to 2021, last season, was the number two overall running back. We have seen him be extremely productive with 29 touchdowns in those last 28 games without Melvin Gordon in the lineup and 146 receptions in those 28 games. Just to put it in perspective, obviously, 29 touchdowns, 28 games, that's one per game. That's great. We, we love that. But 146 receptions, not targets, receptions per game, leaves him at a 5.21 average. I mean, that's that's pretty much a full touchdown almost in a full PPR scoring format and certainly a lot of help in a half PPR scoring format, not even including the yardage that they are gaining per reception. Obviously, Austin Eckler is just a machine. And he's going to continue to be one of these top-level guys. In fact, in the last five years, he's one of only 13 running backs to surpass 1,500 total yards and 15 total touchdowns in a given season. That level of productivity is fantastic, especially considering he came into 2021 with a hamstring injury. If you guys remember, week one against Washington, didn't see him catch a single ball because he was still you know, hamstrung, for lack of a better term, and needed some time to heal from that. Nonetheless, the division's fantastic, playing against the AFC West. Uh, since 2019, against the AFC West, 18.48 fantasy points per game in the 11-game span. It was even better last year in the six contests that he played against the Broncos, Chiefs, and Raiders, averaging 21-plus fantasy points. A lot of production there and continues to build my confidence in his potential future. Now, speaking of, let's talk about what this offense is and why he continues to succeed in it. Austin Eckler had a new offense coordinator last year, Joe Lombardi, former quarterbacks coach of the New Orleans Saints. The reason why I make this apparent is because really Austin Eckler last year was what you know Alvin Kamara was in 2020. When you go ahead and you stat for stat compare Alvin Kamara from 2020 and Austin Eckler in 2021 in terms of rushing attempts, yards, touchdown, targets, receptions, everything. Obviously Alvin Kamara had a little bit more opportunity in the receiving game, Drew Brees, and had a little bit more touchdowns, obviously because of that six touchdown Christmas Day game. If you remember, you remember. Ultimately, the stats were relatively close between the two. And honestly, I'm led to believe that we are on pace to potentially see another one of these high productivity seasons from Austin Eckler. Obviously, in terms of ceiling, he has the potential to meet guys like Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry, but with the potential of where this offense is going in 2022, I think the number four spot is a perfect position for this young man. Now, when we talk about guys like McCaffrey or Kamara, he is in that class. He's not there yet because he hasn't been given as much opportunity to be a starter, but he's getting there. I mean, no other running backs besides Eckler, Kamara, and Christian McCaffrey have more seasons of 90 plus targets as of the last five years. That's a small company of guys, and they continue to develop and be high fantasy producing running backs because of that. I mean, when we look at the games in which Austin Eckler has participated with Justin Herbert under center in the last two years. In the amount of routes that Austin Eckler ran, 629, he was targeted 157 times. That's a 24.96% target percentage. That means one out of every four routes that he ran, he was targeted. I mean, that level of productivity is insanity to me, but I love it. That's why we continue to harp on the potential of what Austin Eckler presents and what he's going to continue to produce going into 2022. The last thing that I wanted to mention in regards to the offensive coordinator and the opportunities that he has been given. Obviously, we know in years past, the Los Angeles Chargers and even New Orleans Saints were amongst you know the teams that gave their running backs the most opportunities in terms of targets and overall rushing attempts every year. Because again, we saw Austin Eckler and Melvin Gordon share a backfield. We saw Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram share backfield. And a lot of touches had to go around in those respective offenses. But this last season... The Chargers took a little bit of a dip in terms of overall opportunity to their running backs. But with that mentioned, Austin Eckler still handled 300 total opportunities, got himself a bunch of touches, and really, I don't know if he's going to be able to eclipse more than 300 in a given season in terms of total touches. So regardless of whether or not they're in the middle of the pack or the bottom of the pack, as long as their team continues to at least have 450-ish total opportunities for their respective running backs, Eckler is going to be always in a great position. Now that we've talked about receptions and of course that defining Austin Eckler, I wanted to also define why he was so successful in 2021, mainly via his red zone rushing attempts and red zone opportunities. Last season, he was number two overall running back in terms of red zone rushing attempts with 47 that led to 12 rushing touchdowns. He was the number six overall running back with 12 rushing attempts inside the five yard line that led 
to seven rushing touchdowns. And he was the number one running back in terms of uh, running back targets within the red zone. 16 targets that led to eight receiving touchdowns. The fact that this team is so willing to give a small stature running back the ball down on the goal line and his ability to find the end zone regardless of what's in front of him leads me to believe that, of course, this is going to continue. I don't care about Isaiah Spiller's implementation to this offense, and I'll mention that in just a bit. But as long as Austin Eckler is attached to one of the most successful offenses in the league, a team that was number four overall ranked in terms of total offensive yardage with 6,634 last year, Herbert's only getting better. This offense is only going to keep you know, getting themselves into the red zone and finding Austin Eckler more opportunities in prime positions. The last couple things I wanted to mention. Offensive line. They're only improving. Obviously, last year made huge improvements with bringing in Corey Lindsley at the center position, drafting Rashawn Slater. They drafted a first-round offensive guard, Zion Johnson, going to play the right guard position across the board. Center tackle guards. They have one of the best run blocking units in the National Football League. It is not even close. According to Pro Football Focus's grades last year, this is, in my opinion, on average, the best amongst all the teams in the league. Now, I understand the offensive line improving and Brandon Staley, the head coach of the Chargers, mentioning, hey, I want to run the ball more. I want to get into situations that late in games, I can run the ball consistently and kill clock. They've, they've gone ahead and they've committed to that. Not even just with his quotes, but in their actions. They drafted offensive line. They drafted running back and they drafted a fullback in the 2022 NFL draft. That in itself leads me to believe that, yeah, they're not lying. They're going to run the ball more. But am I worried about Isaiah Spiller's potential impact? No, I'm not. Because even if, for example, the Los Angeles Chargers have the exact same amount of opportunities for their running backs and you give Eckler everything that he sustained last year and whatever is extra, you give towards Isaiah Spiller, that is a potential of 124 rushing attempts and 24 total targets. Do you think he's going to need more than that? I don't think so. Giving him 150 touches or potential touches seems to me like a perfect sweet spot for that kind of a running back. They're not going to run two you know, back sets like they did in years past. Again, last season, they only ran you know, 21, 22, and 20 personnel 6% of the time. It's not something that we're going to see from this respective offense. And that is why I think Austin Eckler maintains himself as a top five back. Speaking of top five potential running backs, let's talk about Najee Harris going into his second season. It wasn't really a surprise for many of us ranking Najee Harris as an RB1 last year and the potential success he found because, you know, what are the Pittsburgh Steelers? When we look at the Pittsburgh Steelers history and their running back history, they've all found success, whether it's Le'Veon Bell, D'Angelo Williams, James Conner. They have all been given prime levels of opportunity and all delivered on it because the offenses are built around a one back set and the fact that Najee Harris was coming out of Alabama with the amount of talent that he showed and the fact that he was so you know vital in the passing game at Alabama 70 receptions in his two years at Alabama as the you know primary starter led me to believe of course he's going to fill in perfectly and by all means he did I mean, it wasn't even close. The amount of fantasy points he ended up producing on a weekly basis led many of us to a very successful 2021 season. But another stat that I wanted to mention in terms of why I have so much trust in Najee Harris going into this upcoming season, well, since 2014, the starting running back of the Pittsburgh Steelers has produced a top six overall running back ranked season on six out of the last eight occasions. We've seen James Conner, Lev Bell, D'Angelo, uh, D'Angelo Williams in seasons past all be number six or better in their respective years. The only time we haven't seen running backs, the only two seasons where we didn't see a running back produce top five numbers was James Conner when he kept dealing with those injuries in 2019 and in 2020. So of course, Najee Harris picking up the mantle, becoming an RB1, I think that momentum's only going to lead to more success for this young man. Last year, he did something that no other running back did. He played 85.66% of the offensive snaps, pretty much 86%. Not only that, he handled 86% of the Steelers running back opportunity out of the backfield and had 87% of the total touches. Like that in itself is crazy to me. He is going to be a workhorse, probably gets himself somewhere close to 400 total touches this upcoming season because last year he had 381. And without Ben Roethlisberger in the lineup, they're going to have to continue to lean on this young man. A guy that from weeks 1 through 17 averaged 16.01 fantasy points per game in a half PPR scoring format. So let's talk about this, right? Besides the fact that he's able to find a lot of success and is going to be given opportunity, when he's given 
extreme elite levels, like 20 plus touches per game. He's averaged 19.18 fantasy points per game. That's 11 of the 16 games he participated in last season at a healthy rate where he didn't leave due to an injury. That's 70% of the time he's been, he was given 20 plus touches last year. Not only that, he tied Austin Eckler in terms of total targets last year, had the most receptions amongst all running backs last year, which is crazy. And against the AFC North, a, you know, relatively difficult division considering the Bengals are no joke. The Baltimore Ravens have been a consistent run-stopping defense for a while. And, you know, that defensive line for the Cleveland Browns, they're not bad. Yep, Najee Harris, 17 fantasy points plus against that division last year in the games he participated against them. Let's talk about the final thoughts regarding Najee Harris as we approach our 2022 drafts. When we look at the history of running backs that have been RB1s, specifically guys in the last, you know, five seasons here, uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Kareem Hunt, Alvin Kamara, Saquon Barkley, uh, Jonathan Taylor, all those running backs who established themselves as RB1s followed the following season with another RB1 performance, unless they dealt with an injury. So Jonathan Taylor went from the number six to number one. Uh, Barkley, number two overall running back, his rookie year to number 10, and so on and so forth, remaining as RB1. So thinking to myself, Najee Harris has a pretty good chance. Last year, a lot of the concern that revolved around the Pittsburgh Steelers regarding you know the offensive line, can they hold enough to where... Najee Harris can find himself some gaps and find himself success. We talked about it last year. Respect the talent of the running back. Don't worry about the offensive line. Yes, offensive lines are bad, but eventually they'll do their job. And once they do, this running back will take over. Not only did the Pittsburgh Steelers address their offensive line deficiencies this offseason by bringing in Mason Cole. He was a top 13 center in terms of run blocking last year. They brought in James Daniel. He's a top 20 guard in terms of run blocking last year from the Chicago Bears. They've gone ahead and improved the interior of their offensive line. I mean, tenfold. You go ahead and re-sign Okafor at the right tackle position. This is going to be a significantly better line in comparison to last year, which only generated 0.9 yards before contact on average, which was ranked 29th in the league last year. They weren't really helping Najee Harris out very much last year. Now with an improvement on the interior and the right side, we're going to see a lot of potential for this young offense potentially going ahead and, and producing some great numbers here. Last thing I wanted to mention. The quarterback position, obviously, without Big Ben, this is not going to be the same team. It's going to look very different. But I mean, to be honest, I I've looked at the stats. I've looked at you know the, the splits with and without you know Ben Roethlisberger over the last couple of years, from 2019 through 2021, with and without Ben Roethlisberger, running back production in this offense. Running backs only average 2.5 points more per game, which honestly, throughout a 17 game season, is a huge upgrade. But I think, you know, the, the absence of Ben Roethlisberger really doesn't make too much of a difference in my eyes in terms of running back exposure to opportunity. It's more of an idea that this offense was so bad last year because of how bad Ben Roethlisberger was that they couldn't score early and they were often put in negative game script situations. Let me go ahead and give you an example. In the 18 games that the Pittsburgh Steelers played, regular season and postseason, they scored 37 first quarter points. They only scored four touchdowns in the first quarter all last season. The last time they did so was week 10 against the Detroit Lions. If you're not able to command a lead early and run out the clock in the second half because your quarterback cannot throw the ball and you cannot get first downs, much less score field goals or touchdowns in the first quarter, you're not going to find much success later on in the game when you want to run the ball with Najee Harris. Hopefully, the young implementation of a Trubisky or a Kenny Pickett is going to offer more. I've looked at uh, the overall opportunity of targets that Trubisky has given to his respective running backs. 2020, the last time we saw him in a starting role, he averaged 5.63 targets per game to his respective running backs. I think that's a decent number. It's more than Ben Roethlisberger as of the last two seasons, which was 5.54. When you look at Kenny Pickett, his amount of opportunity that he gave to his respective running backs in college, it's a little bit different. They ran a lot of RPO over there. I mean, both Trubisky and Pickett are mobile quarterbacks. We're going to have a little bit of an offense here where maybe we take a little bit of alleviated pressure off of Najee Harris by having that mobile threat and having a, an option of maybe the quarterback keeping the ball and preventing those defensive linemen from crashing down so easily. Either way, Najee Harris, fantastic selection here. If you go ahead and pick him, that's my number five running back this season. Moving on, number six, Dalvin Cook. Listen, Dalvin Cook's a fantastic running back. I mean, he, he's a top five guy typically. 2019, number five, 2020, number three. And obviously last year, because of the injuries that he sustained, was only able to get to the number 15 overall running back slot. But I certainly do believe 
he's a top six back going into 2021 because of what we have seen him produce in his career and where the offensive trajectory is potentially pointing towards in 2022. A couple stats that I wanted to mention, of course, from 2019 through 2020 with Kirk Cousins under center. I mean, Dalvin Cook has been incredible, averaging 19.92 fantasy points per game through a 38-game stretch. Throughout that span of time, 36 total touchdowns, 25 total games of 100-plus total yards. I mean, when we look at the fantasy point contributions that Dalvin Cook has put forth, in the last 38 games he has played, 35 times he has put up more than 10 fantasy points. That's 92%. 26 times, which is 68%, he's put up 15 or more fantasy points. And 18 out of the 38 times, which is 47%, he's put up 20 or more fantasy points. He's just some... He's an automatic success, and I only think it's going to get better. As this offense continues to improve, they bring in a new offensive coordinator, and they change the regime that was once so like heavily fixated on you know, not really letting this offense breathe. I think Kirk Cousins is going to improve, which is only going to force defenses to have to respect Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne, Irv Smith, and you know Adam Thielen that much more, which will open up running lanes for young Dalvin Cook. Now, as we progress, we're obviously going to be put in a situation where Alvin Cook may have to, you know, deal with some injuries. He may have to deal with some situations where he may get less opportunities in the running game or in the receiving game because of the offensive switch. Just kind of looking at it from this perspective. From 2019 through 2021, this offense gave their running backs the second most rushing attempts in the National Football League and the fifth most total RB opportunities in the National Football League. Again, they're a pretty good team. And when they play against teams like the Green Bay Packers, Detroit Lions, and of course the Chicago Bears, those are relatively easy matchups throughout a season, which of course Dalvin Cook found a lot of success in with Kirk Cousins under center, averaging 22.42 fantasy points in those 12 games over the last three seasons. So where's the problem here, Andrew? Well, the hesitation a lot of people have regarding Dalvin Cook is injuries. Throughout his entire career, he has never once played a full season. Of course, he had an early rookie season where he Towards the ACL, the, the following season had a hamstring season where he couldn't get anything off the ground. And Latavius Murray was obviously still present in that team. But over the last three years, still missed at least two games a year. If you want to go ahead and say, you know what, he's going to miss two games. We're going to chalk that up. I still think he's the top six back. That level of productivity, 19 plus points per game, even if it dips a little bit because of the change of the offense. I still think he's incredible. And to be honest, the offense as a whole... I mean, regardless of what we've seen, you can go ahead and draft Alvin Cook and very easily go ahead and maybe in, in round 12, take Alexander Madison and it'll pay dividends because Alexander Madison, when he is filled in for Dalvin Cook in games that he has had 15 plus opportunities, Alexander Madison's putting up 20 plus fantasy points per game, five touchdowns in those six contests. That's the offense and it's just built to help running backs succeed. And I think Dalvin Cook is going to continue to strive in that direction. When we go towards 2022, we have to talk about Kevin O'Connell, former offensive coordinator of the uh, Rams, new head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, former offensive coordinator, in fact, of the Washington football team, uh, Washington Commanders, if you want to call them that, um, when Kirk Cousins was there. So he already has a relationship with Kirk Cousins. That is going to be primed and ready to go. That offense is going to be firing on all cylinders. But Let's talk about what the Rams did in the last couple of years in terms of their rushing attempts. They were ninth in the league since 2020 in terms of total RB rushing attempts and 19th in terms of opportunity. There's going to be a little bit of a dip, in my opinion, in running back targets. I mean, we haven't seen the Rams target their respective running backs at an extended rate since Todd Gurley departed from the team. Now, Dalvin Cook is at that high level that maybe they want to go ahead and start passing the ball to their respective running backs. But if we end up seeing a dip from Dalvin Cook in the receiving game, I don't think it hurts that much for him, but it certainly will play a factor. I mean, overall, when we look at Dalvin Cook and his career, 2019 through 2020 averaged 4.05 targets per game, 3.24 receptions, and 28 receiving yards per game. On a full 17-game season, well, honestly, he's going to miss two games. So let's say, for example, it's a full 15-game season. We're talking about 61 targets, 49 receptions, and 425 receiving yards, which really is a lot of help in his overall argument as to why you want to draft him. I know he missed a lot of time last year, and many people may be thinking he's regressing, getting to the point where he might be falling off that proverbial cliff. But let it be known, last season, 
Despite only playing 13 full games, he was still the number six overall running back in forced missed tackles uh, with 47. He had the sixth most first down rushing attempts with 56, had the thir third most rushing attempts of 10 plus yards last season amongst all running backs, and had the second most rush rushing attempts of 15 plus yards amongst all running backs. A lot of those categories only behind Jonathan Taylor. I think this is a fantastic team. The offensive line, despite not having big name guys, still continue to be some of the best in the National Football League as they've built a young core with Christian Derrishaw and Ezra Cleveland, uh, you know, former first and second round picks over the last couple of years. Dalvin Cook should be in a prime position this season. Let's move on to Joe Money Mixon. Joe Mixon, you know, besides probably Christian McCaffrey, was the most polarizing guy every single season as long as I can remember. Obviously because we've seen him be incredible. 2018 was the number nine overall running back. In 2019, unfortunately, had an underwhelming year, despite having two more games played than the prior season, was only the number 13 running back that year. So kind of left a salty taste in many people's mouths. And then we got to the 2020 season, where unfortunately, Joe Mixon was injured after six games into the season. I mean, throughout that first weeks, you know, first six weeks, this guy was the number nine overall running back in fantasy football. He was elite, but the injury stacked up and people had had enough of him. Going into 2021, the amount of slander this man received and the injury bias that was against them that is currently against guys like Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey allowed Joe Mixon to slip into a point where he was, you know, a late first, early second round pick, which by all means was a steal considering he finishes the number three overall running back in 2021, became one of those only 13 running backs in the last five seasons to surpass 1,500 total yards and 15 touchdowns in a given season. That jump from being a guy that many people aren't really, you know, sure about to being a top three running back is huge. But I'm here to tell you that that just wasn't a one year jump. Joe Mixon has been this running back since 2019. And the reason why I say this is because I can exactly pinpoint the moment that Joe Mixon has been this guy. Week eight, 2019 London game against my Los Angeles Rams. I know it because I watched that game very closely. Because in that game, Joe Mixon was given incredible opportunity. And since that game, week 8 of 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me, he's been averaging 16.42 fantasy points per game through that 31 game span. In fact, has averaged 22.67 uh, opportunities per game. And as it says on screen, 22.19 touches per game. This is at the level of which, I mean, I mean, it's more touches per game almost than guys like Jonathan Taylor on in the conversation of Derrick Henry. You know, Najee Harris, these guys, they're getting elite opportunity. And that is why Joe Mixon has found so much success. So don't let it be, a, a, you know, a narrative that, man, he, he really succeeded because of Joe Burrow. No, he's been this guy. He's just, you know, had the unlucky injury every now and then, but has now been given the commitment of this offense and has continued to develop and become the player that we all knew he could potentially become. So when you consider potentially drafting Joe Mixon, you understand He's going to get a lot of opportunity and he's going to be able to deliver on it even against his own division. I mean, it's crazy that in the last you know couple games that he's played against his own respective division, the AFC North, the last 11 games, he's averaged 19.03 fantasy points per game. That's against the Steelers and the Ravens, two of the best run-stopping defenses in the league. It does not matter. When you're giving this man this much opportunity, points are going to overflow for this offense. And it is what it is. I mean, what else more can I say about the opportunities he's been given? We're talking about an offense that in 2021 gave their respective running backs the 13th most rushing attempts and the 14th most opportunities. That's fantastic numbers. Now, for those of you who are sitting there and cynically thinking, Andrew, but Joe Mixon is still injury prone. He's going to get hurt. What part of the 20 games that he played consecutively last year and the 22 you know opportunities per game that he averaged going even into the NFL playoffs wasn't enough to prove to you that that narrative is pretty much a myth. It, it, it's something that happens to every running back and we just can't, we can't plan for it. We just have to hope that he's going to be healthy. Again, he's only 26. So when we're talking about the opportunity this team has given their respective running backs and specifically Mixon, now that you have no more Giovanni Bernard in this backfield and you're getting more opportunities and more targets in the direction of this young running back, it's only becoming that much more of a solidified position for Joe Mixon to take the number seven overall running back spot for my rankings. That's why I have him there. Now, another one of these reasons why, you know, Joe Mixon really took a step forward is obviously offensive efficiency. In terms of scoring touchdowns, when you look at 2020 compared to 2021 with Joe Burrow, okay, under center, 
The Cincinnati Bengals went from a team that was averaging 21 and a half points per game to 27.1 points per game. They went from being, you know, middle of the pack to top seven in the National Football League, scoring 52 total offensive touchdowns last year. That kind of productivity is obviously going to lead to Mixon getting a lot of goal line touches. And the fact of the matter was, he got those opportunities, the fourth most amongst all running backs last year. 14 attempts inside the five-yard line that led to seven touchdowns. The number one problem with Joe Mixon is that he is not going to get 60 receptions. He is nothing, he's not going to even get anything remotely close to those numbers because truth be told, they don't see him as a three down back in that regard. Last season, he only played 16% of offensive snaps, which were third down and long situations. So like third and seven and on, he was never on the field. In fact, he only played 42% of the snaps during two minute offensive drills. This is a guy that Yes, was able to maintain 52%, almost 53% of the running back targets last season from this backfield. 52% of 70 targets isn't much for this young running back. So until they decide to make him a full three down back, he's going to have those limitations. But I don't think it's enough to where we're knocking him down the board too far because truth be told, the Cincinnati Bengals offense is going to look a lot better in 2022. And I'll tell you exactly why. The main stat that I have up on screen that I just kind of transitioned to was since 20, uh, week eight of 2019, this man has averaged 4.16 yards per carry on average. The reason why that is so important is because he has been running behind one of the worst offensive lines in the National Football League, yet he has been incredible. Last year, amongst all running backs, had the sixth most rushes of 10 plus yards, had the 10th most forced missed tackles, had the 18th highest yards per carry after contact with 3.09, minimum of 100 rushing attempts per running backs. And now you go ahead and completely revamp that offensive line. You bring in Ted Karras, formerly of the New England Patriots, the play center. You bring in Alex Kappa, of the, uh, formerly of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, to play right guard. And you bring in Lyle Collins, one of, if not the best run blocking right tackles in the National Football League from the uh, Dallas Cowboys last season. You bring them in, you add that on top of Jonah Williams, who of course played very well last season. And you know, a, a middle of the pack uh, left guard, Jackson Carmen, that's fine, it doesn't matter. It is going to be a huge improvement in comparison to what this offensive line had in years past. I mean, there's a reason why this team wasn't able to win a Super Bowl. We saw them almost lose to the Tennessee Titans because they allowed uh, Joe Burrow to get sacked nine times in the second half of that Super Bowl. Joe Burrow got sacked seven times. And I know that's different between allowing up sacks and being able to run block. But if you can protect Joe Burrow, the team's going to find more success. They're going to find themselves in the end zone. And Mixon going to find himself with far more fantasy points in his back pocket. All right, now that we move on from Joe Mixon, let's go ahead and let's talk about our next running back. But before we do, if you've gotten to this point, be sure to, of course, subscribe to the channel. Click the like button down below if you have not yet already. We're talking about fantasy football content for the entirety of the 2022 season. Yes, at some extended rates. I know I've been talking for a while here, but you got to get your information if you want to be able to decipher through who is the most valuable running backs at this top tier position. Let's talk about DeAndre Swift going into 2022. He's a former Georgia running back. When I think of Georgia running backs, I think of Nick Chubb, Todd Gurley, Sonny Michelle, all guys that have found pretty good success in the National Football League as of late. But when you know DeAndre Swift was drafted in 2020, he wasn't really drafted to be the immediate starter. I mean, there were still Carryon Johnson and Adrian Peterson in that lineup that were ahead of him. I mean, Adrian Peterson was coming off of back-to-back -back seasons with Washington, which he surpassed a thousand plus yards. So Adrian Peterson had, you know, the potential of being that number one guy. Yet DeAndre Swift, it didn't take long for him to outshine both of those guys and eventually send them packing out of the league. DeAndre Swift, after the week five bye week that they faced in 2020, from week six to 17, was a completely different animal. And it was the number nine overall running back throughout that span of time. He proved to not only us, but the Detroit Lions that he can be that guy for their team. I mean, number nine overall running back throughout that span of time, I currently have him as my number eight. The reason why I have him as my number eight is because of what he was able to accomplish last year in 2021, prior to his injury that he sustained. From weeks one through 11, he was an absolute machine, averaging 15.8 fantasy points per game, which is great. It was an improvement on the year before. But in those 10 games, was the number seven overall running back in fantasy in a half PPR scoring format. So, of course, 2019, or sorry, 2020 was the number nine overall back. Last year was the number seven. You meet that in the middle. The number eight overall spot for DeAndre Swift looks like pure magic to me. I think he's only going to get better as this offense only going is only going to improve. I mean, they're not going to only win three or four games. I think they can really 
surpass their six and a half. I think that's what the total is at right now and potentially win seven games and get themselves in a position where they're scoring a lot more points on a weekly basis, mainly because DeAndre Swift is leading them in that direction. But I wanted to go ahead and mention a couple stats before we continue on uh, in regards to his potential. Last season in 2021, the Detroit Lions out of nowhere gave their running backs a boatload of opportunities. And we all kind of saw this coming because Anthony Lynn was their offensive coordinator, formerly of the Chargers, who, of course, we knew from 2017 through 2020, Anthony Lynn had given his respective running backs the most opportunities in the entire National Football League. So last year, the Troy Lions had the 10th most rushing attempts and had the 5th most RB opportunities. Now, obviously, the game scripts in which they were in, losing by a lot of points early on in the season, definitely benefited the fact that DeAndre Swift was getting himself 6.7 targets per game and 5.3 receptions per game. Very similar to Austin Eckler. And to be honest, that is where a lot of the comparisons are being pulled towards. A lot of people are saying DeAndre Swift is this season's Austin Eckler. And I, I honestly agree with that kind of sentiment because really... This is a guy that could very easily find himself with 80 receptions in a year and can very easily see himself with maybe 12 to 16 rushing attempts per game. He's not going to get himself 20 a game, 20 rushing attempts a game. That's not him. That's not his play style, and we shouldn't expect that. So as we progress, hopefully this offense is going to continue to feed their running backs the ball and get themselves in positions where, of course, they're targeting this young man. I mean, looking at the amount of production he has found in the receiving game. In the last 25 games he has played, he has had 22 games of four plus overall targets. That in itself is incredible opportunity. When you look at his overall target percentage in terms of routes run by targets from 2021 and 2020, on average, he is being targeted once every four routes he's run. That is identical to the numbers that Austin Eckler has produced over the last two seasons. Now, the question is, where is DeAndre Swift potentially faltering? I mean, is, is it all just rainbows and sunshine, Andrew? It's not the case, unfortunately. DeAndre Swift was an extremely inefficient runner last year. In eight consecutive games last year, he had himself 52 or fewer rushing yards. That is literally what Ezekiel Elliott has been burnt for all offseason. People have put Ezekiel Elliott over the fire and are roasting him because they think, well, Ezekiel Elliott's washed. We saw this young man produce identical numbers throughout the early half of the season, but it took a little bit of a change, a kind of a little bit of a shift in the offensive play calling for DeAndre Swift to elevate and get to another level. And I'll explain to you exactly when that was. In week nine, after the bye week, the Detroit Lions moved on from Anthony Lynn being the play caller and allowed Dan Camel, their head coach, to play call for the rest of the season. That helped the team significantly. In fact, from weeks one through nine, the team averaged 16.75 points per game in terms of overall scoring. While from then on out, from weeks 10 through 18, the offense, significantly better, averaged 21.22 points per game. When you go ahead and you give the perfect play calling to Dan Campbell, and he allows this team to get into you know positions where they're scoring early and they're in contests, of course, DeAndre Swift was able to find himself a lot of success. In fact, from weeks 1 through 8, this young man had 289 total rushing yards. Very low number, numbers, but from weeks 10 through 11, he put up 266 yards, while in the first eight weeks, was only able to put up 289. The shift that we saw in this play calling certainly allowed DeAndre Swift to be a complete monster, and I think we're only going to see that take you know even further steps in 2022 as we progress. Because again, if you're going to see him catch the ball out of the backfield, as much as he did last year, which probably will based on game scripts, but not only that, get more opportunity on the ground. I mean, the sky's the limit for DeAndre Swift in 2022. The last couple things I wanted to mention was the offensive line and the offensive line being the identity for this team, mainly because they get three of their starters back. You get Taylor Decker back, you get Frank Ragnow back, and you got uh, Vitae coming back, the offensive guard. You add that on top of Jonah Jackson, who was a pro bowler last year, on top of Panay Sewell, who was a top five run blocking offensive lineman. That's how Dan Campbell has pretty much built this team. He wants to dictate the game from the trenches. He talks about biting kneecaps all the time, right? That's why he's drafted offensive line and defensive line in the first rounds these last two seasons because he wants to build from the trenches and I think they're going to dictate games from the trenches going forward in 2022. Moving on, we have Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette's a fantastic running back to say the very least. In fact, in three of his first five seasons in the National Football League, he has been a top 10 running back in fantasy football. I mean, Obviously, some injuries have plagued him in 2018. Wasn't able to get that many games in. 2020, going from, you know, cut by the Jacksonville Jaguars, signing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and not finding much of a stride while Ronald Jones, you know, ended up producing a great year there. 
wasn't able to find much success. But the main topic that kind of revolves around Leonard Fournette, which I want to kind of disband, is his injury history and that being a factor as to why people don't want to you know, potentially draft him. I understand. Since 2017, he has missed 18 games in his career. A lot of other running backs have missed a boatload of time. But what Leonard Fournette presents that other running backs don't is incredible upside within one of the best offenses in the National Football League. Let's talk about Lombardi Lenny. Let's talk about what he has done since the NFL playoffs and what he has been able to contribute to this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense, regardless of whether or not Gronk, AB, Rojo, you know, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans have been in the lineup. This man's been able to produce week in and week out. Late in the 2020 season, Ronald Jones went down with an injury. Le you know, Lombardi Lenny took over in the playoffs and in those four games, was unstoppable and helped them win the Super Bowl. I'm sure we're all aware those contributions certainly helped Leonard Fournette maintain the starting job in 2021. Though, in the first three weeks of 2021, you know, Leonard Fournette wasn't really given much opportunity. He was only getting about 12 touches per game, was the number 41 overall running back, and then this team finally realized, wait, why are we giving the ball to Ronald Jones? He just fumbles and makes mistakes. We don't need to have this guy on roster anymore. Have him sit aside and let Leonard Fournette take over, and that's exactly what he did. From weeks 4 through 14 of the 2021 season, Leonard Fournette was the number 3 overall running back in fantasy, averaging 18.8 .8 fantasy points per week in a half PPR scoring format. And a lot of those contributions had to do with the fact that we're talking about a Tom Brady-led offense that is scoring high amounts of points in a division, which in my opinion, yes, the Saints are a tough run-stopping defense, but the Carolina Panthers, the Atlanta Falcons, those are cakewalks, and it certainly paid dividends for Leonard Fournette getting all the touches in this backfield. And if you even just go back to 2020 and look at from weeks 15 through now, in terms of just regular season games alone, he's been averaging 16.8 fantasy points per game. We've seen a lot of productivity out of him. We've seen him get comfortable in this offense. And we've seen even Tom Brady open up to the idea of continuing to feed this man the ball because he knows he is capable of delivering. And the numbers that I wanted to specifically go over in regards to Tom Brady, 2021 Tom Brady was legendary. And hopefully he just continues on that pace as they've retooled that offense with Russell Gage and Julio Jones coming into the offense, despite Gronk and AP going out. Overall, when I think about the potential and the production that Tom Brady presented, 719 total passing attempts and 5,316 total passing yards. Th th those are career highs. In fact, he even had career highs in passing completions. 43 passing touchdowns, second to his only 50. That one year, they almost went undefeated. He had the third highest fantasy point per game average of his entire career in a standard format. I mean, Tom Brady was unbelievable. And when I think about Tom Brady and what he's done in his career and the high volume of passes this offense has continued to kind of develop, it makes me think of James White and compares James White to Leonard Fournette because in those last four years with the New England Patriots, White had himself 86, 72, 123, and 95 targets. The fact that we saw Leonard Fournette get a boatload of targets this last season really shouldn't be much of a surprise to any of us that he got 84 targets. And there was a span of time, 10 weeks, in which he had 63 targets, averaging 6.3 targets per game and five receptions per game, as you can see on the graphic on screen. That in itself, whew, on top of the fact that he's associated with an offense that is going to be stacked at wide receiver, Julio, Godwin, Gage, and Evans, how are teams going to be able to stack the box? They can't. They purely cannot, which will only open up running lanes for this young man and get himself into positions where, of course, he's not only going to catch the ball because of Tom Brady's preference to just dump it off and check it down, mainly because Tom Brady's been immobile his entire career. He has to check it down. But we've gotten into a position where we got a running back here that has insane opportunity. And it mainly has to do with the fact that not only does Tom Brady love to check down the running backs, but so does Bruce Arians. I know Byron Leftwich is now the offensive coordinator, but Bruce Arians is kind of, you know, still the puppet master here in this, this team. Bruce Arians, if you guys remember, allowed David Johnson to be that top level back. David Johnson got to a point where he had 120 targets, 80 receptions, 800 yards in a season, and was the number one RB in that given year in 2016 because Bruce Arians builds offenses around dumping it off to their respective running backs. I think there's a lot of potential for Leonard Fournette going forward. The fact that Ronald Jones is no longer in this offense, the, wrong to, the fact that there's no A, B, or Gronk only builds more and more opportunity in the passing game. And I understand that there may be some potential in which Julio and Russell Gage come in or maybe Rashad White comes in and takes some targets. It's not going to play that big of a factor to where Leonard Fournette is going to fall out of the top nine, in my opinion. And that's why I have him in this position. The only thing I wanted to mention before we move on to our next running back, obviously, Ryan Jensen. 
this last week. Sustained a knee injury, who he's probably going to miss upwards of a couple months. Otherwise, we have still one of the most talented offensive lines with Donovan Smith, Tristan Wirfs. They traded for Shaq Mason this offseason, one of the best run-blocking offensive guards in the league. I know Ali Marpet retiring and Alex Kappa going to the Cincinnati Bengals and, of course, Ryan Jensen injuring himself. That means the entire interior of this offensive line is gone. But that, in my opinion, just means Tom Brady is going to be getting the ball out of his hands that much faster as the interior pressure is going to get to him. The checkdowns to Leonard Fournette are only going to build and, and just make him that much more of a solidified fantasy asset. Let's move on to the thumbnail for today's video. We have Saquon Barkley of the New York Giants. Listen, I love Saquon Barkley just about as much as anybody. I respect the amount of talent that he has and the amount of opportunity he is potentially going to be given this season. But we got to talk about his history. Of course, 2018 through 2019, in 28 games, averaged 19.74 fantasy points per game. I mean, an absolute machine on the ground through the air was able to do everything, averaging over 120 yards per game throughout that span of time. And in fact, dominating his own division. I mean, against the NFC East, those teams were afraid of him because every time they played against him, the dude was just putting up more and more points, averaging 22 points plus against that division. Now, after those first two years, Unfortunately, Saquon Barkley, boom, was hit with a giant ACL, MCL tear that derailed his career. And it is going to be, uh, you know, tough, obviously, coming back from that injury, missed all of 2020. And in 2021, really wasn't able to find his footing. In fact, in 2021, in comparison to his first two years in, in the NFL, had a 17, nearly 17% 17 drop in terms of total snap share, wasn't really able to find much explosivity in terms of rushes of 10 plus yards, obviously saw less targets per game, less touchdowns per game, and less yards per carry after contact per game on average. That kind of overall production dip mainly has to be contributed to the fact that, you know, you tear your ACL, you're not going to be the same player. There's a reason why I'm so kind of hesitant on players like J.K. Dobbins or a James Robinson coming off that Achilles. Those kind of injuries are not a joke. And it really does concern me with some running backs. But now that we're going into the second year coming off of that ACL for Saquon Barkley, I really think we may be in a position where he's going to develop into the running back of old. And the reason why I think so is because, I mean, when, when Saquon Barkley has not been in this lineup, the New York Giants starting running back has still found success. So regardless of what happens, Saquon Barkley is going to be a 15-point running back. Whether he's a 19-point guy is a different conversation in itself. But as of right now, I think he's very easily a 15-point back based on what we've seen from Wayne Gallman in 2020, where from week 7 through 13, averaged 14.9 fantasy points per game. We even saw Devontae Booker last year from weeks 5 through 9 put up 14 fantasy points per game. Now, unfortunately, just when we thought Saquon Barkley in 2021 found his stride early half of the season, weeks three and four, where he was averaging 22 plus fantasy points per game, where he ended up dominating that Saints in that contest, ended up stepping on an ankle the week after and was completely derailed and came back and really wasn't ever the same. So where does that leave us in 2022? We got a new head coach slash offensive coordinator in Brian Dable uh, coming over from the Buffalo Bills, of course, helped Josh Allen completely turn around his career which hopefully he'll be able to do for Daniel Jones. But in terms of running back opportunities, the Buffalo Bills were amongst the fewest in the league. They were ranked 30th in rushing attempts since 2019 and ranked 32nd, the worst in the league in terms of running back opportunities. Is that a concern? No, because there wasn't a Saquon Barkley on the, you know, the Buffalo Bills. There just purely wasn't. There was a Josh Allen that was taking rushing attempts and there was Zach Moss and Devin Singletary and uh, well, Frank Gore, who really, you know, shouldn't be looked at as elite level guys like a Saquon Barkley. I'm not really too worried about the transition for Dayball and continuing to find success for running backs because the fact of the matter is when we go back to the 2020 season, we start from weeks 14 through the playoffs, okay, divisional round with Devin Singletary. There was a seven game span there where Devin Singletary was averaging 18.2 fantasy points per game. There is a place in Brian Dayball's heart where he knows he can feed a running back and find a lot of opportunity for that said running back if the offense is putting out great numbers. And Devin Singletary proved that. And I think there is a great argument for Saquon Barkley filling into that role and being an elite back. And that is why I have him as my number 10 going into 2022. Now, I did mention Josh Allen, his rushing attempts, his rushing attempts, I mean, in the goal line area, whew, that is scary. If Daniel Jones ends up producing anything similar to that, that could be very uh, intimidating because, you know, Josh Allen the last couple years 
eight, eight, nine, and six. Those are the amount of rushing touchdowns he's put up. Amount of rushing yards, 631, 510, 421, and 763 this last season. I don't think Daniel Jones is at that point. I think Daniel Jones at best, probably a 400 yard rusher, probably scores one or two rushing touchdowns occasionally. That just helps Saquon in my opinion. It's not going to take rushing attempts because it's just going to pose the threat to a defense and defensive coordinators that they have to respect that quarterback's rushing ability. And it'll prevent backside defense events from crashing down and going after Saquon when they have to go ahead and, of course, keep an eye on Daniel Jones keeping that ball and moving with it. Now, speaking of Daniel Jones, while we're still on the topic, I wanted to do some research and see if Daniel Jones is a good enough quarterback to at least keep Saquon Barkley in the loop in terms of running back targets. In the last 37 games that Daniel Jones has played fully and healthy, he has targeted running backs 5.76 times per game, which honestly isn't that bad in comparison. If we look back at Saquon Barkley's 2018 and 2019 incredible seasons, he was averaging about 6.75 targets per game. If we get a little bit of an uptick, we could get back to that number. I don't think we need to, but it's always certainly on the table. Last thing I wanted to mention, offensive line. Saquon, for as long as I can remember, going back to 2018, has always had the worst offensive line in the league. They have recently kind of struck gold. Andrew Thomas really has turned into one of the best offensive tackles in the league. They drafted Evan Neal out of Alabama. They bring in John Feliciano, formerly of a, uh, he was a guard of the Buffalo Bills. He has that connection with uh, Brian Dayball. You bring him in. You go ahead and side Mark Lewinsky from the Indianapolis Colts, one of the better run-blocking offensive linemen who are available in this uh, last free agency period. I think you have an offensive line that is going to take, I mean, major steps forward and is going to only help this young man, Saquon Barkley. Another thing, final thing I kind of wanted to mention. Saquon Barkley has been quoted this offseason in saying, I'm beginning to trust my knee again. This offense is beginning to move me around to places that I haven't been since college. Not only are they moving him around the formation, whether it's out wide, in the slot, in the backfield, but the, the, the quote that he is beginning to trust his knee again is ginormous for my confidence, not only his. If he can be confident that he can trust his knee on every single cut that he makes, then why can't I trust him to make every single play when he's given the ball? I think he's in a fantastic position. Like I always talk about, talent plus opportunity equals success. I think that's exactly what we're going to see from Saquon Barkley in 2021. Let's go ahead and move on to my 11th running back, Aaron Jones. A lot of hype is revolving around Aaron Jones this offseason, mainly because, you know, of course, Devontae Adams leaving, Marquez Valdez-Scantling leaving, and the potential in which Aaron Jones is probably going to elevate himself. Now, I understand I have him a little bit lower than some others may, but it's mainly because of A.J. Dillon. And we'll talk about that in an extended rate, but let's talk about what Aaron Jones has been able to accomplish and why there is so much, you know, trust in him. In the last three seasons, since 2019, he is ranked as the number two, five, and 12 overall running back in fantasy half PPR. This is all while in the last two seasons, Aaron Rodgers has been, you know, a back-to-back -back MVP, and Aaron Rodgers has thrown 85-plus touchdowns. That in itself, taking away from Aaron Jones, uh, you know, potential opportunities could have made it a threat, but it really hasn't been a threat. It has only helped Aaron Jones as he has found the end zone 40 times in the last 45 games he has played, which has obviously led to his 16.19 fantasy point per game average in the last 45 contests. In fact, since 2019, Aaron Jones has been able to surpass 1,100 total yards, 10 total touchdowns, and 47 receptions in each of the last three seasons. Can't find a lot of running backs that are able to put up that level of productivity, and that's why I think he's a guaranteed RB1, regardless of everything around him in this offense. When we look at the opportunities this man's been given, obviously he's not a running back that is going to get you know, 20 plus touches in the game, but his receiving game is what elevates him. When Aaron Jones has had 15 plus opportunities in a game, that's 31 out of the last 45 games. That's 70% of the time. He's averaged 19 fantasy points per game. When he's played against his division rivals in the NFC North since 2019, 15 games averaging 18.47 fantasy points per game. There's a lot of productivity to be had out of this young man. And I just continue to find more and more reasons to like Aaron Jones and draft him Every single time I'm on underdog fantasy looking in that second round, I'm like, dude, how can I pass up on Aaron Jones after already solidifying another RB or potential stud wide receiver in my first? So now we progress and we get to the position of talking about, you know, the opportunities of this backfield, why I'm not too worried about Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon coexisting. Prior to the arrival of Matt LaFleur, the current head coach of the Green Bay Packers, this offense was abysmal in terms of running the ball. They were the 30th ranked team in RB total opportunities, and 32nd, last in the league in terms of total rushing attempts. Then you bring in Matt LaFleur, formerly of the Tennessee Titans, brought in that run-heavy offense, that scheme, 
and they went from being the bottom of the league to being top 10 in both categories, which has, of course, led to the success of guys like Aaron Jones, which has led to the success of you know Aaron Rodgers taking that step from being a guy that, you know, 2017, 2018 was only throwing about 20 touchdowns a year to now being a two-time MVP back-to-back. Now, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of opportunity to go around in this backfield. Jamal Williams, you know, when he coexisted in this offense 2019 and 2020, he was getting about 150 opportunities and touches a year. A.J. Dillon this last season, I mean, vaulted himself to the 225 touch range, which obviously kind of poses a threat to Aaron Jones, but I'm not too worried. A.J. Dillon last season was fantastic, but I think this offense, as we progress in 2022, are going to have to rely upon the running game even more because of the absence of you know, Devontae Adams and statistics kind of proven that. Now, the thing that kind of maybe adds a little bit of concern and why I have Aaron Jones a little bit lower is because in the games that both these guys played together and AJ Dillon ended up scoring, Aaron Jones was an active participant in those contests. In fact, when you go and look at the red zone rushing attempts that we've recently seen from both these guys, it is a bit concerning to, to kind of get an idea that from within the five yard line, AJ Dillon had more rushing attempts and more rushing touchdowns than Aaron Jones. Those are the things that concern me. But again, what defines Aaron Jones isn't his red zone rushing threat, even though in seasons past he has gotten himself upwards of 15 touchdowns on the ground. It is his receiving threat that is going to be amplified due to the absence of, a, uh, you know, one, Devontae Adams and Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Since 2019, there have been eight games in which Devontae Adams has missed due to injury or has left the game early. In those games, Aaron Jones has averaged 25.68 fantasy points per game, averaging five receptions per game, averaging over 120 total yards and one plus touchdown in every single one of those contests. The reason why Aaron Jones becomes such a huge threat in this offense when Devontae Adams was not in the lineup is mainly because there's nowhere else for Aaron Rodgers to send the ball. I mean, think about it. Aaron Jones has been the number two receiver of this offense for three consecutive years in terms of total targets and even receptions in that in that matter. I mean, 68 targets, 63 and 65. When you are the number two in this offense, of course, when the number one is gone, he's going to look in your direction and you're going to find success. So when we look at the fact that Aaron Jones has had nuclear numbers without Devontae Adams and this backfield has gotten that much more opportunities per game in his absence, I'm thinking, yes, Aaron Jones should be able to vault himself into a situation where he's dominating on a weekly basis. Now, the numbers that you see on screen, 86 targets, 68 receptions, 600 yards, and eight receiving touchdowns, those all took place from running backs in those eight games in which Devontae Adams had been absent. I mean, those are only eight games of stats in terms of receiving alone. Kind of puts it in perspective just how much potential upside the Green Bay Packers running backs have this upcoming season. And I think the sky's the limit for a guy like Aaron Jones. Let's go ahead and move on to Nick Chubb and our, as our final running back to close out our top 12 for this upcoming season. We have Nick Chubb sitting here in a position where, I mean, honestly, he is one of the most consistent runners. The fact that he's been able to find a baseline over the last couple of years of 1,000 total yards, eight touchdowns in four consecutive seasons, obviously has solidified himself as a top 12 back in fantasy, 11 last year, nine the year before, seven the year prior in 2019. If you're going to continue to be an RB1, then I'm going to go ahead and, and rank you as such because I trust you to get the work done, averaging 16.89 fantasy points per game in his last 23 healthy games with the Cleveland Browns. Last season alone, Nick Chubb was the number two running back in terms of yards after contact per attempt with a 4.24 yard per carry average. I mean, that is insanity to me. He was number three in yard per carry average with 5.52 yards per carry and was the number three overall running back in rushes of 15 or more yards. Let's talk about... Kareem Hunt, because he is the you know primary threat. And the reason why I have guys like Aaron Jones and Nick Chubb lower is because they do have primary threats that could end up impeding in their potential. Without Kareem Hunt in the lineup, Nick Chubb is a monster, averaging 19.96 fantasy points per game. And that's five games out of the last two seasons in which that's taken place. Now in the contests that of course Kareem Hunt has been active for, that's 18 games in the last few years, Nick Chubb still averaged 16.03 fantasy points per game. Yes, it is a huge dip between having him in the lineup and not having him in the lineup but i can assure you it's not from receiving yards or any of those numbers in fact without cream hunt in the lineup you know nick chubb is still only averaging 1.8 receptions per game and 21 receiving yards per game he's only getting a 0.4 uh, total reception boost on average and 10 receiving yards so basically he's getting one extra point per game because of the absence it's mainly due to the fact that he's getting more rushing attempts and touchdowns 
And that's mainly where Kareem Hunt has kind of gotten himself into a situation to impede in Nick Chubb's overall potential ceiling. Now, with that being said, of course, Nick Chubb continues to find success against his own division. You know, 15.08 fantasy point per game average in the last eight games against the division obviously speaks volumes, uh, you know, to say the very least. But the numbers that I wanted to look for was snap counts. When Nick Chubb has played 50% or more snap counts, he's averaged 16.66 fantasy points per game. When he's played less, 13 and a half. Huge difference. So again, Kareem Hunt is going to play a role if he's going to be healthy and active for the entirety of the season. And whether it is, you know, Kareem Hunt or Dernis Johnson, it doesn't really matter. As long as there's another running back breathing down his neck, it is going to be a little bit of a problem, which is why I have him as my number 12. Now, let's talk about this offense, similar to the Packers in the idea that once their head coach came in, their current head coach, the scheme changed completely. Kevin Stefanski, prior to his arrival with the Cleveland Browns, the Cleveland Browns were an okay running team. They were the number 15 overall team in terms of total running back attempts and number 13 in running back opportunities. That has completely changed since Kevin Stefanski's arrival. Coming from the Minnesota Vikings, which was a team that was number two in rushing attempts in 2019, ended up here the last two years and has led this team to being a top five team in both categories of attempts and opportunities in itself even if cream hunt is active nick chubb is still going to get his touches and if that is going to be the possibility then they can be mutually exclusive we just got to hope that cream Hunt doesn't steal some touchdowns which is certainly always a potential but we'll have to just keep an eye on that as we progress final things that i wanted to mention in regards to nick chubb the quarterback position is obviously in flux but i i certainly do not believe that jacoby Brissett is worse than an injured uh, Baker Mayfield. I think injured Baker Mayfield is worse than Joe Bacobi Brissett. So that in itself is a plus. If you end up getting Deshaun Watson into this lineup, by all means, this team could very easily be one of the best in the National Football League. Let's just kind of put it in comparison. In 2020, the year that the Cleveland Browns went to the playoff, uh, they were averaging as a team 25 and a half points per game. They were an 11-5 football team. Pretty good record overall. On the other side of the league, the Houston Texans were a 4-12 football team averaging 24 points per game. Deshaun Watson can put up points. He can lead his team to the red zone. And Nick Chubb will only benefit from his overall you know, presence if, in fact, he is going to be on the field and not suspended for an extended period of time. So regardless, I think the quarterback position is only going to help Nick Chubb. I've looked at his early schedule. You know me in matchups, man. Nick Chubb, even with Jacoby Brissett in that first six weeks, if it ends up being a six-game suspension, whew, should be an absolute machine tearing apart the league and finding a lot of success in fantasy football. Of course, this is one of the top offensive lines in the National Football League. I don't really even have to mention it. It doesn't matter whether it's Kareem Hunt, Dernis Johnson, you know, a fourth string running back, Nick Chubb, doesn't matter. This line makes so many plays for their respective running backs. It just makes it that much easier. Jedrick Wills, Joel Petonio, uh, Wyatt Teller being the two best offensive guards uh, in terms of a tandem on a team. Obviously, both have top five guards in terms of run blocking graves, according to the pro football focus. You get Jack Conklin back from the injury sustained last season. Um, they obviously let go of J.C. Treader, uh, their center. They brought in Nick Harris. I think they're going to be perfectly fine in finding a lot of success. All right, that should do it for us. Those are our top 12 running back rankings for the 2022 fantasy football season. Yes, I talked for a very long time, but that's just how I function. I can't talk about players without giving the full scope. And I probably could have talked about these players for three plus hours, but... Hopefully this kind of gives you guys some perspective as to how I believe these guys are going to produce and gives you a little bit more of an idea as to how you can navigate and value these players in 2022 drafts. Be sure to check out Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code Andrew today. Again, if you sign up, Underdog Fantasy is willing to match up to $100 of your first deposit. If you guys are interested, of course, be sure to subscribe to the channel. We're making fantasy football content for the entirety of the 2022 season. So if, in fact, you want to stay up to date on my latest content, be sure to click the bell notification button. Subscribe. We're making daily content here. Click the like button down below and let me know, are there any running backs that I didn't have in my top 12 that you have and you think are potentially sleepers to make the top 12? Or are there any guys that are in my top 12 that you don't believe deserve to be in this conversation? Let me know down in the comment section. Again, down in the description, we certainly have our Patreon link and our, our public Discord server for those of you who want to check that out. Patreon there, you can find rankings and a lot of help from me personally answering your questions for those of you interested. Tomorrow, we'll talk about early Draft guys strategy for the running back position. Till then, guys, I'll see you. 2020 is going to be an exciting year. Peace.